couldn't make it, and I wish him well. I'm sure he will be online. Um, I welcome you all here, but also our friends online. I've heard many people online. Um, it's great to see so much interest. For this morning, we've got two excellent keynote speakers. And we don't have much time, so I'll just kick into straight away the first uh, speaker. I would like to introduce you to uh, Litwin Smits. He's a professor of One Health and Environmental Epidemiology at Utrecht University at the Faculty of uh, Veterinary Medicine. Uh, the chair falls under the Interfaculty Institute for uh, Risk Assessment Sciences of the Department of Population Health Sciences at Vet Veterinary Medicine at and the UMC at Utrecht. If you're a bit confused, I'm a bit confused, but we just say Utrecht University. Uh, in her research and teaching, uh, Professor Smith focuses mainly on the impact of the living environment on health from a one health perspective. The relationship between humans, animals, and environmental health. So her talk is uh, titled Assessing Environmental Factors in COVID-19 Outbreaks, a One Health Approach. Welcome, Professor Smith. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. And I would also like to thank the uh, organizing committee for inviting me to speak here today. And it's a, really a great pleasure for me to, uh, to speak to you about the importance of assessing environmental factors and also about the importance of using a One Health approach in COVID-19 and other infectious disease outbreaks. And I hope many of you are already familiar with the One Health concept. Um, but One Health is um, an approach that um, gives emphasis that the health of people and animals and ecosystems are closely linked and interdependent. And of course, for zoonotic infections and, and things like antimicrobial resistance, um, it's, it's very clear because they're very strongly uh, connected um, uh, to, to the One Health concept because pathogens can move between animals, humans, and, and the environment. But more recently, there's more emphasis also on the role of the, of the larger environment and um, by addressing the need for clean water uh, air, uh, safe food, and taking action on, on climate change. And of course, that links very well to the goals of the ISEE. So if you look at One Health research um, that is published over, over the last decades um, across various disciplines and, and sectors, there was this very interesting bibliometric analysis done. Um, and it shows that um, especially the medical science is very central to publications on One Health, uh, looking at prevalence of, of certain infectious diseases. And also from a veterinary perspective, there's a lot of publications on, uh, on One Health. And both these um, clusters are very central in, uh, in this network analysis. Then there's another cluster on microbiology, which is um, prominent but it's also self-referential. It has less links to the other clusters. And public health and anthropology are two other clusters which, which are much less prominent. Um, and also there are key concepts like prevention and management and community science um, are peripheral in this uh, network. So the authors of this, this analysis, they concluded that one Health has a success, but it has also challenges, especially integrating social sciences, but also integrating the environment in, uh, in a true One Health uh, approach, and also including more researchers from various disciplines. And I realize that I'm preaching to the choir here, but we should integrate environment much better in a One Health approach. Why should we do that? Well, of course, environmental systems like air, water, soil, and food, they can be a reservoir for, for various pathogens, or they can directly influence pathogen spillover from animals to humans. Um, and while there, there's a large number of excellent presentations uh, at this conference on COVID and air pollution, how air pollution can, can modify the risks of, uh, of COVID. 
And there's also various other environmental factors. Uh, yesterday, there was a talk about immunotoxic chemicals, um, for example, that can modify the risk and impact of, of infectious diseases. And importantly, environmental changes, large global changes like climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, pollution, deforestation, and, and urbanization, uh, they are drivers for zoonotic disease outbreaks. Environmental sampling can also contribute to, to pathogen and antimicrobial resistance surveillance. And finally, uh, and very importantly, uh, the implementation of environmental interventions is really key to prevention, like biosecurity at farms or, or hygiene measures. So COVID-19 is, is, of course, a zoonotic infection. So the One Health approach applies very well to, to COVID-19. And over the past 20 years, three human, uh, new human coronaviruses uh, have emerged and all have a zoonotic origin. And well, I, I saw this paper that was published in August 2009, and, and it said, it will not be surprising if new coronaviruses emerge in a new future. Um, well, this, this author didn't have a crystal ball, but it's, it's uh, a couple of months later, we were confronted with SARS-CoV-2, um, and it was already a bit expected that something like that was going to, to happen again. Um, in total, there are seven coronaviruses that, uh, that can be uh, a threat for humans, or humans can be infected with it. They all have um, origins in either bats or rodents. Um, and from bats, they, they can go to other intermediate animals, intermediate hosts, from which they, infect, uh, they have originally infected humans. And sometimes we don't know which animals were the intermediate hosts. So for SARS-CoV-2, uh, there has been a lot of discussion on the origins of, um, of this new infection. And uh, there is a very excellent recent paper in Science um, that states and, and provides very convincing data uh, that the Wuhan market in Wuhan was the early epicenter of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, they do excellent spatial epidemiology uh, to make a very convincing case about that, showing that people who were living or had a link to the Huanan market um, had a lot of, uh, or, or were much more often um, infected with COVID in, in December and January before the uh, pandemic got really large and then it spread all over Wuhan. Um, they also did environmental sampling or they reported environmental sampling. And, very interestingly, this showed <clears throat> contamination of cages and surfaces of places where animals were kept, and those animals are known to be susceptible for, for viruses like SARS-CoV-2. So initially, uh, transmission could have taken place either by direct contact or um, by air transmission. <clears throat> it's also very important to think about events that led up to um, this new spillover event of SARS-CoV-2. And there was this very intriguing uh, preprint paper um, that is making a case for African swine fever uh, epidemic that took place in, in China uh, before the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic started. And this swine fever epidemic, it's not a zoonotic infection, but it le leads to, to extremely high fatality rate in, in pigs. So there was a major short pork shortage um, in, in the year before uh, COVID started. Um, and in this paper, the authors, they very nicely show how certain barriers between humans and animals uh, can decrease and how increased human uh, contact opportunities with, with certain viruses can, uh, can exist if um, if infected wildlife or farmed animals are, are interacting. And in this case, there was probably more meat from wildlife coming to the markets as a result of uh, pork shortages. And other drivers that are going to be very important uh, in the future and, and now already um, are climatic hazards. 
In this very interesting um, uh, review, uh, the authors showed that the majority of infectious diseases that are a threat for humans, so over 60%, can be aggravated by climatic hazards. And at the root of those aggravated risks are often the changed interactions between humans, animals, and their environment. Uh, for example, um, if birds and, and, and mosquitoes interact more often during droughts because there is less water and they interact at water sources, then uh, there can be more uh, transmission of, of um, vector-borne diseases like West Nile virus, which can then be an increased risk for humans. Also, the geographical area, the range where um, certain species are trying to find their foods or where they, they are living, uh, that's, that's increasing, that's changing. And therefore, there's, there's different interactions between animal, animals and humans. Now, back to, to COVID. Uh, during the first um, uh, period of the, of the pandemic, uh, we had seen first spillover from a still unknown animal to, to humans. And after that, it, it spread efficiently between humans, also because we have the habit to, to travel all over the world. So in a, in a very large city of Wuhan, there is, there is easy spread um, because people travel so, so much. Um, it's very likely that this kind of spillovers happen more often, but then stay maybe in a village. But in a very large city, it will... It will uh, easily uh, go beyond borders. What also happened is spill back to animals. And why is that important? Well, in animals, um, a pathogen can find a, a reservoir. So if you try to contain an infectious disease solely in, in humans, uh, you may end up with animal reservoirs from which there will be spillover again to humans. Another threat is that um, there might be mutations in viruses, and that can be faster or different in, in animals. So it's, it's very important to also study animals in, uh, in COVID. So in February 2020, uh, the first animal, a dog, um, was found to be PCR positive for SARS-CoV-2, and after that, cats were, were studied and found to be, uh, to be positive. Um, and also experimental work was done showing that cats can easily transmit the, uh, the infection between each other uh, and also ferrets, which are uh, mustelids uh, that are often used in, in lab experiments also for, for influenza. Then um, symptomatic tigers and lions were found to be positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the Bronx Zoo in New York. Um, and the first case when, when a farm was found to be uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2 was in the Netherlands in April in 2020 when a mink farm, and mink are kept for their fur, they are not, uh, they are not eaten, uh, those farms were, were found to be uh, infected. And fortunately, important other um, livestock like pigs and, and, and poultry, uh, cows, they cannot be infected with SARS-CoV-2, because imagine the, the enormous problems we would have. So this mink farm uh, was infected in, in the Netherlands, and this is a country that's both very densely populated, but it also has a very large livestock fact, uh, sector. And the mink farm that was found to be infected in, in April was in the southeast uh, of the country, where uh, there, is, there is a lot of pig farms and broiler farms, uh, but also mink farms. And for the context, it's, it's, it's important to know um, how uh, COVID started in the Netherlands, because some remarkable spatial correlations were seen. Um, it was seen that, especially in the first phase of the pandemic, um, disease cases and hospitalizations occurred in the southeast, which is not... Uh, the most densely populated area in the Netherlands. Um, and that, that is what was seen in many other countries, especially in urban areas. There was a high number of, of cases, but in the Netherlands, it, it was not, not like that. Um, and it was a strong correlation with, with farming activities, uh, also with ammonia air pollution, which is a, uh, an air pollutant from, from agriculture. 
And currently there is still a lot of studies going on on air pollution and uh, COVID in the Netherlands. Uh, these studies are led by the National Institute for Public Health. Um, I'm not going to, dis to discuss that today because there are so many already on air pollution and COVID. And another very interesting correlation, and that caused a lot of concern among people living there, um, was the correlation with Q fever epidemic in 2009. And Q fever is another zoonotic uh, infection. Um, and we had a very large outbreak in 2009. It was caused by infected dairy goat farms. Uh, and it caused a lot of uh, deaths um, and a lot of morbidity. And a lot of people still have symptoms like long COVID, but then long Q fever. Um, so many patient organizations and many people living in the area, they were extremely concerned and they were, they were thinking about, well, how, how does that relate to the farms in our area? But there were other things that were also important. For example, school vacations um, were later in the southeast. So that means that during the peak uh, in Italy, um, when a lot of transmissions occurred, people were there on skiing holidays. And a lot of people from the south brought COVID back home. And also, we had a huge super spreader event, Carnival, which is a large festival also occurring in, in the Catholic Southeast. So until now, it seems very unlikely that air pollution had a, had a major role here. But you can imagine the concerns that were living in, in, in this area. So when the first mink farms were, were found to be infected, uh, immediately a large study was, was uh, started and uh, a true One Health approach was taken by including uh, animal studies like looking at the spread of infection in mink, but also in farm cats and dogs. Uh, the environment was included by looking at viral contamination uh, in mink houses and outer air. And we also looked at, at spillover events from mink to, uh, to humans. And there was um, a roadblock of four, a radius of 400 meters around the farms because people were really afraid that it would spread so if you look at SARS-CoV-2 infections in, in mink, it's, it, it's very similar as in humans. This is a, um, this is a mink with, with COVID. It's, you can see it breeding very fast. It has a pneumonia. Uh, sometimes you see uh, the, e, the eyes and the nose. Uh, they, they seem to have a cold. They're coughing and sneezing. Um, but in many cases, also infections go unnoticed. Um, and the infections or, uh, at these farms were detected because of the increased mortality at these farms. Um, they were initiated by human to mink transmissions. And the farmers could really recall that they had celebrated carnival and then they felt feverish. They went to, um, uh, to, their, to their stables, worked with the animals uh, and had possibly trans transmitted their COVID to their animals. Um, and until the end of 2020, it, 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 it continued with, with transmissions from farm to farm. And in total, 68 out of all the 126 farms in the Netherlands were infected, despite increasing uh, preventive measures. Um, and by, the end of, by January 2021, the Dutch government decided to ban mink farming in the Netherlands uh, forever. And worldwide, 12 countries, especially Denmark and the United States, they reported also infected mink farms. Well, we conducted environmental sampling at diverse um, areas in mink farms. Uh, in the mink houses, we, we took samples in the cages. Um, we took indoor air samples in the stables and also outdoor air samples on the premises of the farms, but also close to the farms and um, a bit further away. Um, and you could see that inside the mink houses, most of the samples were, were um, we could detect uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA and also in air samples. Um, but as, long, uh, as soon as we um, were a bit further away from, from the farm premises, we could not detect any uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA anymore. So inside the stables, as, as I said, the swipes of cages, bedding material, um, passive air samples, uh, there, was a, there was a very high percentage of positive samples, um, especially if a cage was sampled of a recently uh, deceased animal. 
Um, and also two weeks after um, the farm was culled, uh, still the majority of samples were, were above the, the LOD. So based on the air sampling close to the farms, the, um, the municipalities and the, and the government decided to, to lift the precautionary uh, area measures. We also studied a mink to human uh, infections because a lot of the farmers, they also uh, got COVID. Um, we had confirmed human cases at 41 out of 68 farms, <clears throat> which is an underestimate because we were not allowed to, to test all the farmers. Um, and we know from phylogenetic analysis um, that there were five independent introductions at mink farms. So five times there was a spillover from humans to animals, and after that, it spread in the area. Um, and all the human sequences that we could, uh, could sequence, they were related to, to minks uh, on the same farm. And in many cases, with the phylogenetic analysis and epidemiological analysis, um, we found evidence that there was spillover from mink again to humans. Well, fortunately, we, we did not find any spillover in the, in the nearby communities. Only three sequences were found to be related to minks in people living in the Netherlands. Um, and, and, well, the local human population did not seem to be infected by, um, by mink farms. Well, we also studied other animals at the farms because we were worried that possibly um, the infection could spread from cats to other animals and then maybe to other humans again. Uh, and there's a lot of cats in mink farms because mink are carnivorous animals and they're fed with meat. So they attract a lot of cats. And well, we captured the cats and we tested them. And in almost 20%, we found evidence of, uh, of a COVID infection. And also in the household dogs, we found, um, we found COVID. And again, we found that the, the cat sequence that we could generate, that it clustered with mink sequences, showing that mink to cat transmission was, was a highly likely route of, of introduction. So regarding sampling the environment in COVID, it has also uh, led to a surge of studies on bioaerosol sampling and, and interest in the analysis of biological agents in, in our environment. Um, this study was done in our group on uh, nursing homes, and it tested various uh, samplers, just con conventional samplers, uh, using filtration, uh, impingers, um, but also bioaerosol samplers uh, using cyclones, uh, passive samplers, and swabbing uh, surfaces. And all the different um, equipments showed a high percentage of positive samples in, in the air, in rooms of, of people who were positive for SARS-CoV-2 in, in, in nursing homes. And the problem is that you only can show SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Um, it's not so easy to show infectious virus. Um, it's, it's difficult to find a, a positive culture. So um, what they did was they tried it with 44 samples that had a high viral load and only three oropharyngal swabs of, of the nursing home residents and one active air sample um, from that they could culture uh, the virus. And no SARS-CoV-2 RNA was detected in the air or in the immediate surroundings of, of the patients who tested negative. Um, so infectious virus can be detected in the air, but it's, it's, a very, it's very difficult. Um, and methods are needed to, um, uh, yeah, to improve that. Um, but we also see that both conventional and, and specific bioaerosol sampling techniques can be used to detect uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Um, and detection seems to be a bit more often found in larger uh, size fractions. Another study that we, that we did was in a slaughterhouse um, during uh, the first year of COVID. There were many outbreaks in, in slaughterhouses and meat packing industries. Um, and we did our study in, um, in, a, in a very large slaughterhouse where a lot of people appear to be testing positive when 
it, we had screened them for, for SARS-CoV-2, uh, about one third were positive, although they were asymptomatic. Um, and we tested a lot of surface swaps um, and, and air samples, but we only found very limited um, environmental contamination in this environment and, and just one positive personal air sample. And this also shows how difficult it is to do this kind of studies in, in a real life situation because as soon as there are uh, detections of, of positive people, um, the management will take all kinds of interventions. Um, there is intensive cleaning of the areas and, um, and people are, are probably staying at home or there's other, um, yeah, other measures and interventions. So that's, that's probably one of the reasons we only found a few uh, positive samples here. In the future, we also uh, continue to do um, intervention studies. Um, especially in schools and nursing homes. Um, we're going to test interventions like air cleaning systems and also look at ventilation policy and ventilation systems. And we're going to measure SARS-CoV-2, but um, well, as we all know, it's, it's, it's changing all the time what you can find. Um, so we're also going to include other viruses, bacteria, fungi, and generic molecular markets, markers. So it's also of use for um, basic indoor air quality uh, uh, increased knowledge. Um, of course, it's very important to, to include all kinds of covariates like occupancy, viral pressure, um, but also CO2, temperature, uh, humidity. Um, then finally, another, um, uh, another study or studies that we are doing is, is looking for viral surveillance in the farm environment. Um, farms are, are very rich microbiological uh, environments and um, using uh, modern molecular techniques are, are very, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's extremely helpful for uh, this type of um, surveillance studies. Um, in one of our infected mink farms, for example, um, we also did agnostic uh, deep sequencing of samples, and there we, we found a, a mink alpha coronavirus strain that was not found before in, in minks. And of course, the mink farms are, uh, are not there anymore in the Netherlands, but it shows that there are maybe other viruses with zoonotic potential around. Uh, a similar study was done in chickens, um, and there we also looked well, both at feces samples and at dust samples. And it's very interesting to look at dust as a matrix of, um, uh, of, of viral exposure because dust can, can also be emitted from farms and it can reach people living nearby or it can uh, be inhaled by farmers. And we, we found that chicken feces and farm dust had very similar uh, viral contents, viral com composition. So there is a lot of lessons learned from COVID-19 and also for future uh, One Health challenges. And there will be many future One Health challenges. Um, we, we absolutely need close collaboration between disciplines, between animal, public health, and environmental authorities and, and scientists, <clears throat> because we, we really need to better understand and prevent emerging infectious, but also non-infectious diseases. And of course, we should not forget the environment in One Health. So thank you very much for, for your attention. I would also like to thank uh, our fantastic group in Utrecht at the Institute for Risk Assessment Sciences. So thank you. <clears throat>
Are you in including the wastewater-based epidemiology in, uh, uh, for future surveillance? Because that is the very non-intervention, non-intrusive kind of surveillance, cheaper, but also it gives a very good uh, early detection of any future uh, pandemic. Yes, wastewater is, is definitely one of the um, yeah, envir <clears throat> environmental systems, um, which is extremely interesting for surveillance, um, not only for, for SARS-CoV-2, but it's also used, for example, for antimicrobial resistance. There's many very interesting studies on that. Um, I, I didn't include it in my presentation, um, as, as personally I'm more focused on, on air sampling, but um, I, I think water, air, um, soil, they're all very interesting in, in doing studies like this. Thank you. Annette? Yeah, so many thanks for this excellent presentation. Um, looking at your maps, I was wondering how we can address the transborder issues because um, I know the German COVID-19 landscape well, and of course there are similarities, and I guess probably also on the agriculture sector, it's not so different. So what would be your advice how to approach these uh, regional um, effects? Yeah, that, that's an excellent point, because we tend to really look at, uh, at our own countries, and by doing epidemiological studies, we often see borders as a sort of a nuisance, so we remove people living close to the border because we simply don't know what, what kind of agricultural activities are there in, in Germany. We, we know it very well because we have access to this kind of data in, in the Netherlands, but not in Germany or in Belgium, for example. Um, but for infectious disease spread, it's, it's very important. I mean, in, in the Q-fever epidemic, for example, it was just focused on the Netherlands, while certain of those, those uh, goat farms were very close to the border. And uh, I think there has been very limited communication and, and studies in, uh, in border regions. So, um, of course, there, there are um, interregional uh, zoonotic um, uh, initiatives, but, but that should definitely increase. I, I totally agree. Uh, ah, a question there right at the back. Yes, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. I was wondering your thoughts about the intersection between One Health and chronic diseases, because many of the One Health type of variables, even infectious agents, have strong implications for chronic diseases, particularly diseases related to the microbiome and neurodevelopment and neurodegenerative disorders later in life. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, um, well, fortunately, also the One Health um, Initiative and, and Alliance is now looking much broader. So not only at zoonotic infections uh, by themselves, but also at comorbidities, but also at other risks, like, like you say, for uh, changing microbiomes in relation to changing uh, biodiversity or... Um, um, or, but also like allergens, um, so, th so there's a large increase. And, but on the other hand, um, I think the One Health concept should also not, not move only in the direction of making it, it way too broad, because then it's simply the same as, as planetary health or environmental health. Um, it, it, it's really based on the collaboration between the veterinary, environmental, and, and human health sectors. But I, I totally agree, and I, I really like the studies that are more focusing also on, for example, um, agricultural air pollution and, and other chronic diseases, um, but also like long, long COVID or long-term effects of, um, uh, of infectious diseases that are, that are very well known to, to occur. Right at the back, and, uh, thank you. Thank you, hi, this is Mary Rice from Boston. Thank you, Professor Smith, for an excellent talk. You've so clearly illustrated the importance of this area of research, understanding the spread of infectious diseases between animals and humans, and our food supply. And I was struck by the story of the mink farms being shut down permanently in the Netherlands, and thinking about expanding this area of research, 
having buy-in from the agricultural sector to do studies like you've done, testing the workers and the animals. Um, what can you say about overcoming barriers and um, achieving buy-in from the agricultural sector to do this kind of work in the future? Yes, well, we, we also see that there's more and more <laughs> more and more barriers to studying uh, farmers and farm environments. Um, because of course, in this case, well, there was very strong governmental pressure uh, on the farmers to collaborate in this study. Um, also, they knew already that they were going to be shut down three years from now. That was already decided for ethical reasons. Um, it was just three years earlier because of COVID. Um, so that, that maybe helped in a way, um, but, but I see the problem in, in studying um, uh, yeah, the agricultural sector. And especially because farms are, are getting increasingly large and more industrial, um, more owned by, by uh, larger corporations, for example. Um, it's, it's more difficult to approach them for research and um, well, we, we have done a lot of research on occupational health and environmental health around farms and in the last couple of years it's, it's getting worse and um, I, I know from others indeed that in the United States it's also extremely difficult to uh, study air pollution uh, in, in farms and around farms. Um, yeah, we, we should keep on emphasizing how important it is to know and also that farms can only operate if they are not a risk for their, for their neighbors. But what helped in a way in the Netherlands that was that we had this Q fever epidemic uh, more than 10 years ago, which caused a lot of, um, a lot of concern and it also showed um, that this kind of zoonotic infections are not simply theoretical, it can really happen. And, and a lot of people were, were really, really ill because of that. So, um, so in a way that helped us, yeah. One last question from Tony, please keep it short. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tony Fletcher from London. The, the, I hadn't seen that work on, um, on the genetic classification of the infections, I thought that was, <laughs> Very interesting because it demonstrated there was only a tiny bit of reinfection of humans from the minks, and I'm wondering whether, in the light of that, whether that meant whether that was reassuring, and therefore maybe you didn't need to shut down all the mink farms, or whether it proved that it did it did happen a bit, therefore that was justified, or yeah. was the main reason for shutting down the mink farms to protect people, or, to, or or because it was just endemic in the minks and they couldn't get rid of it. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And it was a very, well, in a way, political decision to, to shut it down. Also because of worries that, well, by the, by the time there were increasing numbers of mink farms that were infected, human cases were, were going down after the first phase of the um, pandemic. Um, and there was the, the worry that the mink farms could form a reservoir. There was also evidence coming in that minks could also be reinfected after a first infection. And a Danish report came out on mutations in mink, and that also uh, caused a lot of uh, uh, alarm. Um, so there, there was a lot of discussion about proportionality um, of, of culling all the minks while there was a lot of spread already in humans. Um, but in the end, the worries about the reservoir forming and, uh, and mutations, and, and already uh, banning mink farms in 2024, that was already foreseen. Uh, so that altogether um, made the decision to, uh, to shut it down. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. We need to move on, but before we move on, I need to give you a little certificate, mm -hmm. so I'm coming over. <laughs>